And welcome to the Museum of the Bible. This is our Thanksgiving special where we talk about thankfulness, gratitude, and whether or not the world is at a crossroads. And we've invited some very distinguished guests to join us tonight for this very special broadcast. Pastor A.R. Bernard, um, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Officer. Ambassador Mike Herzog the um, Israeli ambassador to the United States. Thank you, Armstrong. And Dr. Ben Carson. Um, ambassador, how do we increase resiliency and empathy in so, mankind? So this is the week of uh, Thanksgiving, and I think it underscores the importance of uh, faith and drawing on faith and having gratitude for what we have, what we have achieved. And I think drawing on our faith gives us a lot of strength and resilience to face challenges, to face problems. We live in a very turbulent world today. We see what's happening in Ukraine, other parts of the world. We see what's happening in our part of the world, in the Middle East. Uh, we see what's happening here in America. And I think there are many challenges. And drawing on our faith is an important uh, source of strength to deal with these challenges. It provides a lot of resilience. Yeah, but, you know, the issue, though, oftentimes with the business that I'm in, the broadcast media, we only broadcast the darkness and the chaos of the world. Good is always around us if we seek it. Where do you go to find the good? Certainly... You can't always find it in television. I think sometimes we have to let people know that there's still light in the world. That's true. I think there's a lot of good around us. We uh, tend to focus, certainly the media tends to focus on the bad things, on the negative, but we have to highlight the positive as well. And I think here uh, gratitude comes to play because we give thanks for the good things that uh, happen, that surround us. Uh, you know, in our faith, in um, Jewish tradition, Jewish religion, uh, when a faithful wakes up in the morning, the first thing he does or she does is uh, you wash your hands and you, uh, there's a special blessing. I thank you, God, for giving me back my soul. It's a wonderful way of uh, starting your uh, day. But you start with... A, a gratitude with thanking God Almighty for uh, giving uh, you back your soul. And I think uh, <clears throat> that is a way of looking at the good things because we thank uh, God Almighty and the people around us for a lot of good things that happen to us. They are not coincidental. There's a purpose to think. And uh, we're not, we don't live in a vacuum. And I think that's very important. So, 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 Dr. Carson, where do we go to sort of reinforce people adopting a grateful and thankful attitude in life? Well, I think it's very important that people expose themselves to a lot of different things. You know, some, some of us live in very comfortable settings, and we can stay in comfortable settings. Uh, but that's probably not the, the best idea if you really want gratitude. Expose yourself to people who are not uh, as fortunate. And not just expose yourself to them, but try to do something. Uh, every day, just see if you can make somebody else's life a little more livable. And I think you'll find that that probably brings much more joy than saving up all your money so you can buy a Lamborghini. Uh, but you can have both. There's no question you can have both, but uh, it's just very important to make sure that you actively go out and seek an opportunity to see how the world is for other people. You know, in some cases, you know, in, in my case, I don't necessarily even have to do that because I grew up in dire poverty. I know what it's like. But uh, I also know what an incredible feeling it is to be able to do things for people. You know, I was in the airport uh, three weeks ago in Austin, Texas, and a man came running up to me, and he said, Dr. Carson, you probably don't remember me, 
But 30 years ago, you operated on my three-year-old daughter. She had a malignant brain tumor. Everybody said she was going to die. And I just want you to know, last week she celebrated her 33rd birthday. You know, to be able to intervene in people's lives and do something good, there's nothing that really brings that kind of satisfaction. You know, you know so, something that we often forget, uh, Pastor Bernard, is that the best weapons we have in life are the internal weapons. Smiling, being kind, reinforcing humanity, making others feel that they're valuable, not about the socioeconomic background, not about what they're wearing or what they're driving or where they're living, that you acknowledge the humanity in all people. I think Armstrong, consistent with the conversation here, we have to think about perception as apart from perspective. Perspective is, you know, how, our point of view, but perception is how we interpret. So how we interpret good and evil at work in this world is, is critical because how do we measure cold? We don't. We measure heat because coal is the absence of heat. So we don't measure coal, we measure heat. It's true of darkness. We don't measure darkness, we measure light because darkness is the absence of light. And all it takes is very, very little light to illuminate the darkness. So if we think about the light, and like Dr. Carson said, become agents of light, angels of light, to spread good, identify good, promote good, we'll have a different perception of the darkness that surrounds us. What is the good that we often ignore? Gosh, the good that we often ignore is the power we have to do it, to make a difference. You talked about a smile. Um, you know, instead of being turned off by a beggar in the street, engaging that beggar, doing something. Acts of kindness, acts of charity. You know, that changes the world in which we live. It changes the atmosphere in which we exist. You know, you know, Ambassador, you know, there's a beauty in aging because I don't do the dumb things I used to do. You know, the younger generation uh, celebrate their youthfulness, but there's something about being wise. And you know, I, don't, I, I never feel that anger is something that is absolutely natural. Yeah. Envy and jealousy is not something that is natural. Some of the people feel that you can't, you're not in a relationship unless you have conflict, unless you're arguing. And, but that is just not the natural way of things. And we become things that we've been programmed to become instead of getting away from the order of God. So I agree. Uh, there's a saying in our tradition that anger is a bad advisor. You shouldn't listen to it. And uh, we uh, should connect to our better senses, to our compassion, to our understanding of human beings, uh, to the good things and, and re reason uh, before we come out with an action or reaction uh, to things that are being done. I mean, anger is, is, is a natural sense that every human being uh, experiences, but it's a bad advisor, as I said. And uh, we should connect to uh, other senses that guide us in a better way. Dr. Mm Carson? -hmm. I would just say uh, <clears throat> Proverbs 19.19 says, there's no point getting an angry man out of trouble because he's just going to get right back into it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, the, the way that you look at things and the way that you allow things to affect you has a profound effect on what happens around you. And, uh, you know, we get to control that. We, we have the ability. God gave us these amazing frontal lobes. You know, people have well-developed frontal lobes. Animals do not. Animals have very well-developed midbrains. Midbrains are for reacting. That's why animals react so quickly. But people have the ability with those frontal lobes to extract information from the past, integrate it with information from the present, project it into the future, determine how they're going to react so they can control the midbrain functions. And uh, isn't it interesting that there are some who actually encourage us to act like animals? For instance, there are people who try to teach that the most important determinant of what happens to you in life is the color of your skin. That's a midbrain function. That's not a frontal lobe function. Mm. You know, if I may uh, just 
join that. Um, when we think about hurt, uh, I'm sorry, anger. Anger is a secondary emotion. It's rooted in hurt. Hurt people hurt people. So instead of asking the person, why are you angry? You have to change that conversation. What hurt you? What created the pain that is now manifesting itself in an, an aggression and violence? Because when people are hurt, they become alienated and isolated, and they begin to manifest that aggression and violence. That's why we have the kind of violence that we see in our world. So anger is rooted in hurt. Mm -hmm. We have to get to the point of brokenness. What hurts you? Who hurts you and left you? in this state. You know, I always ask the question when I see somebody who's very mean and nasty, and there are a lot of people like that in D.C., I say, that used to be a cute little baby. I wonder what happened to them. What made them like that? Yeah, yeah, you know? yeah. Well, uh, <clears throat> unfortunately, cute babies turn into uh, <laughs> sometimes animals, and that's very unfortunate, but I agree that we have to ask a question you know, what brought about this uh, situation. Ultimately, I believe that there is good in any human being. We are all created in the image of God. And we should uh, always look for that spark in any human being to the extent possible. If you can bring it out, uh, that's what we should do. You know, I, I actually um, think that all of us who've mentored and been around young people oftentimes adults, the same behavior that we describe, we've seen it firsthand. But we know with the tension and caring, and particularly the, with the presence of men involved in these young men's lives, um, to give them the real self-worth, real self-esteem, make them believe themselves. Because I do think there's a breach in our society with the absentee of fathers mm -hmm. in the household. Because i got to tell you, as myself, there's some things that my mother could have never taught me. You can say, whatever. I don't want to offend women, but it's just fine. The only things that my father could teach me, and not only he's been dead for 30 some years, but those lessons and those teachings are just as to life today as if he were here, because those lessons never die, and those lessons that sustain me. And sometimes I think we think we can come up with policies and programs that we can have a cure for, but it doesn't work unless you have that parental guidance sort of embedded in that child early on. That's important, Armstrong, because government can't raise our children. Mm -hmm. Children learn a sense of identity, they experience acceptance, a sense of belonging uh, within the context of the family. The family is the first place of socialization. They learn about value, purpose, uh, you know, right and wrong judgment. All of those things should be experienced in the family. And in the traditional family that our faith tradition celebrates, the father was foundational to that family, essentially family's father's house. It does not take away from the ontological equality of the woman, but in function, there is a difference. And when the family is intact, you will find the society grows differently. And we'll be back. Don't go away. And welcome back um, to the beautiful Museum of the Bible. I say to people often, uh, whenever I'm here at the Museum of the Bible, I find nothing but light. I mean, it is an extraordinary place of um, just taking us back to the very beginning of faith and spirituality for all cultures. Here you find something for everyone. There's a piece of your history here in the Museum of the Bible that I would encourage you to, to come. You know, I... You know, it's very fascinating, Ambassador, is that you're a general. You're in the military. Um, it is a fact that men and women, when they go to the military, I mean, when you think about the leadership positions that are around the world, people who've been trained by the military, I mean, the discipline, the sacrifice, the respect. I hear so many young people say, well, I'm going to go to the military because I didn't have a father and I'm, I'm about to enter into a world of chaos and I think the military can give me structure. What is it from your experiences that happens in the military 
that may not be happening in the rest of society that give men and women that structure, that discipline, that manhood, what it means to be a son, what it means to be a father. What is it about the military? What is it that get, get so right? So two things that I would uh, underscore, and uh, as you pointed out, uh, I've had a long military career. I'm retired, but spent many years in uniform. First thing, yes, there's something in the military discipline that um, uh, kind of, um, you become more mature at a young age, you understand uh, what discipline is about, you understand how to respect other people, uh, your superiors, your, the people who serve with you. Ultimately, serving in the military is a dangerous uh, occupation. Yeah, you can die. You, you, you are sent into the battlefield and you can die. And you serve with other people and uh, you cover each other. You take care of each other. It teaches you a lot. It teaches you values. And the other thing is, people who serve in the military and risk their lives better understand the others, the, the, the cost of war. They will be much more careful if they have to make decisions about uh, war and peace. These things are, have informed me throughout my life. And so, Pastor, you, 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 it's, it's a similar experience in the church. Um, young, young men thrive in the church if they're there. They're better husbands. They're better in the community. There's something about that kind of structure. But even in what the ambassador spoke about, there's a sense of morality. And, that, and self-respect is so, so important. Military gives you identity, strength, discipline, order, accountability, things that men look for to be a part of. And unfortunately, in churches, we have a lower population of men than we do women. In our church, we have a 48% male population, which is not the norm. The norm is 15 to 20%. But when men are, when boys are in church, they become part of a village where they're learning shared values, sense of vision, responsibility, accountability. And you have all of these elements coming together to shape and fashion them. We intentionally have men's ministry where we minister specifically to men. And we demand that they uh, take on maturity, that they learn how to be decisive. And the only way you can do that is have a set of, of principles that govern your decision-making process uh, to be mature, accepting responsibility for the words, thoughts, motives, actions, uh, attitudes, and consistent. Because consistency breeds stability, especially in relationships that they're going to have in business, uh, whether it's a spouse, to start a family, uh, friendships, etc. So we pour into them. We train them to think and be a certain way. And we've seen it pay off because we have strong families in our church as a result. Um, um, Dr. Carson, when you think about... Uh the military, and you think about the church, but it also starts with the school, the classroom, the household. You know, you know, when we were growing up, talking back to a teacher is just unheard of. You were in the classroom to learn, and you were expected to come home with assignments, and you were expected to get good grades. See, our parents had expectations, of, and then we were children. My parents, and also in our household, my mother and father never sided with us. Even when we were right, they were always together. That household was never divided. Uh, you bring up something that is so vitally important in, in our society today. I, I, I do want to mention that when I was in Pastor Bernard's church, I was very impressed with the men who were there. And not only the numbers, but the, the way that they conducted themselves. It was incredible. But... Um, you know, as far as the schools are concerned, we actually have a crisis that's going on, particularly in public education and particularly in our large inner cities where uh, we're not teaching children not only the basics, but we're not teaching them responsibility. How do you react to people, for instance, who disagree with you? And one of the things that they do in law schools, which is actually a very good thing, is they have these mock arguments where you have to take on the role of the opposite of what you actually think. And what it does is it helps you to 
learn to think about things from other people's perspectives. So, you know, school has multiple purposes. First of all, we have to teach people the basics so that they can function in society. You know, we have a large number of people graduating from places like Baltimore City High Schools who are illiterate. Um, you need to be able to do that so you can read contracts, so you can read directions, instructions, so that you can relate to other people. And when you can't do that, it limits your choices. Um, but also, we need to, once again, teach people something about how you relate to other people. You know, in 1963, we threw God out of the public schools. I think that was a big mistake. He used to have the Ten Commandments on the walls in most public schools. What exactly is wrong with thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not commit adultery, uh, you know, honor your parents, don't envy. What's wrong with those concepts? And when we throw those things out, they have to be replaced by something else. And that something else is infecting our society. And I think that's why we're seeing a downward spiral. What is it we don't... Oh, go ahead, Pastor. Yeah, I, I'm just going to say it's so important. You know, throughout history, Armstrong, um, in every culture, every society, there are three systems. There is the political system, there is the economic system, and there's the moral system. And traditionally, the school and houses of worship, the religious institutions who bring uh, a moral value system to society, they were part of that moral system. So it was not just the education of mind, the intellect, but the building of character that was important to society as a whole. So that's very, very important. And we've gotten away from that because now, especially in American society, when you introduce anything that builds character in curriculum, it's now being deemed religion. You're trying to bring religion. So why is it that morality is now being relegated to religion when it is part of every society, every culture, a sense of right and wrong, standards and values throughout history? And that's what we have to change. And, and just to put an exclamation point on that, you can go to the deepest, darkest jungle of Borneo, and what does the thief do? He waits until nighttime when nobody would see him. He knows that there's a right and a wrong. There's a moral code that's built within us. What about, um, you know, as we think about Thanksgiving, okay, which is upon us, are sometimes... We're not thankful for the right things. Do we really know what thankfulness is, Ambassador? I, I often die, uh, find that uh, we are not fa thankful at the right time or for the right things. And uh, later on, we wake up one day and say, uh, how come we are not thankful for this or that, for friends, family, for our parents, what they did for us, and so on. Uh, one day you wake up and say, how come I did not thank them in time? Uh, that's very important to do it. Uh, it's time sensitive, let me put it that way. And uh, we should be think about this theme all the time, not you know after the fact or when we wake up late in the day. That, but every day we should be thankful for what we have, for what we have achieved. We shouldn't think that it's only us alone in the world, that we operate in a vacuum. There are others around us. We have to interact with them. We have to thank them. We have to thank God Almighty and the people around us who, who help us. And we have to do it every day. What, what do you... Pass. Yeah, I'm going to add, add to, to build on that. Uh, gratitude confirms relationship. Our relationships to each other... It confirms human dignity, the common good, whether it's, you know, in humanity at large or whether it's in special relationship. And we expect it. You know, how many times you, you're walking out of a department store and someone's walking in front of you and instead of holding the door, they let it go. You get offended, right? You feel disrespected. But when they hold the door, they have shown dignity and respect to you. And what do you say? You should say, thank you. It's built into us. It's who we are as human beings created in the image of God. Um, so where are these things that we're discussing on this special? Where are they reinforced? Where can they be reinforced? They, they can be reinforced in our spheres of influence. 
there is everybody, everybody has a sphere of influence. And you get to decide what kind of atmosphere you're going to create there and how you treat people, how you talk to people, how you relate to people. And it has a profound effect on other people. And a lot of times people are observing you very carefully. They're listening to what you say. They're looking at what you do. That really came home to me when I was in Australia and I was operating. And, uh, you know, I needed an instrument and it had blood on it. I said, give me the bloody forceps. And everybody, because, you know, in their culture, that's a curse word. When you say bloody and you put something on it, and they say, Dr. Carson said a curse word. Oh, my God. And I said, I meant the instrument that has blood on it. But, you know, we do set the atmosphere wherever we are. I'm Armstrong Williams, and we'll be back. And welcome back to the broadcast. You know, some people place their value and self-worth on materialism. Uh, and by com comparing themselves to others, which brings about jealousy. And then you have the social media, uh, where it's called influencers and how many likes you have. And if you have dislikes, you have people committing suicide. To me, I mean, it almost sounds insane, but it's very serious. It says so much about the instability of our younger generation, Pastor Bernard. I, you know, there's a wonderful story in the uh, Hebrew Bible, what we call the Old Testament, called the Hebrew Bible. Uh, it's the book of Job. And it's a story of calamity. It's a story uh, where a man loses everything. everything. He does regain it. But the question is not the fact that he worshipped in response, but the fact that he refused to allow his situation to cause him to act, act outside of principle. And he refused to blame God. Mm -hmm. So when you think about his story, what anchored him, number one, was his proper relationship with spiritual and material prosperity. I say spiritual first because God declared him a righteous man. But his relationship with material prosperity, what did he say? God gives, God takes away. Mm. So he had the right relationship with material prosperity. Unfortunately, we don't have the right relationship with material prosperity that we should have. It becomes a status symbol. It becomes a sense of uh, identity. Uh, and it can also escalate to a place of idolatry. So when you lose it, you lose your sense of identity, you fall apart. But Job was anchored in a right relationship with these things. And I think that's what we need to point to in our society. So you mentioned social media. And I think we should discuss not only what might reinforce the theme of uh, gratitude, but also what challenges it. I think social media poses a big challenge because what goes on there is terrifying. No gratitude whatsoever. It's characterized by uh, incitement, by, by hate, by bullying. There are no limits, there are no borders. And I think while I'm a big supporter of free speech for everybody, but this goes to the extreme in many cases. It's just the opposite of what we've all been talking here about. Well, we're probably not going to uh, be able to change people's habits on social media. But it is possible to teach people to refocus on what's important for them. So if, in fact, your central focus is God and godly principles and pleasing God, then it really doesn't matter what people say on social media. But when you remove God from the center those other things become more important. Can you be good and of good character and good morality without believing in God? Well, consider, and, and you're talking to me as a Christian, so we have an anthropology that's rooted in the concept of original sin. Unlike 
Ju the, the Judaistic principle that we're all born good and we need to develop that good. We believe that people are born with good in them, but that good has been undermined by a brokenness and a, a hurt that is a result of alienation from God. So back to what uh, 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 Dr. Carson said, if we get people back to God and back to each other, and why back to God is important? The Apostle Paul said something so beautifully in the book of Romans. He said, when the Gentiles do those things that are written in the law without having the law, they show that there is a universal law written on the human heart. Mm -hmm. He was talking about conscience. He's talking about this, this universal sense of right and wrong. The problem is social media and all that goes on in society seeks to desensitize that conscience from that goodness, from that right and wrong. We have to resensitize them. And the only way you can do that is through a faith tradition. It's through a connection back to God. Mm -hmm. You know, you're... You have a strong faith tradition, very strong. What happens when a conflict uh, in your role as a diplomat? Because we all have compromises, uh, and we all have things that we wrestle with. Um, and sometimes um, we are left um, in sometimes wonderment about how do I always handle this situation? Because things are not as simple as they seem. Uh, things are never simple, uh, certainly in our jobs. But uh, we all come to the job with uh, a basic ideology that guides us. And then um, in the real world, you have to come to compromises. That's true. But I think ultimately, each and every one of us has to define his or her own lines, the ones that you will not cross. And if you are you know, required to cross them, you will just quit the job. It's, it's true in every occupation, not only as a diplomat or as a soldier uh, or as a doctor, whatever. I think it's true of every human situation, of every human being. Uh, each and every one of us has to draw his own line and say, you know, that th these are my limits. So you're speaking of leadership now. <laughs> leadership is the <coughs> example and why is it that so pe few people find that kind of leadership today that's uncompromising, consistent, resilient, courageous, unapologetic? So first of all, uh, not everybody is a born leader. And some people have it in them, some people don't have it in them. It's not easy to be a leader uh, in today's uh, society with uh, social media and everything that's uh, going around. Uh, I think uh, the world in general is characterized by, characterized by a crisis of leadership. And uh, I would like to see the day when we have leaders, uh, the kind of which we had, let's say, the founding fathers of our nation, the founding fathers of your nation, or leaders who guided the world in World War II and other international crises. There are not enough of them in today's world, unfortunately. Are they afraid? of being canceled? Are they afraid they're out of lockstep with the rest of the world? Uh, I think a lot of them are politicians. And uh, politicians care too much about what other people think and not enough about what is right and wrong. You know, there's a crisis of morality. And when there's a crisis of morality, it follows that there will be a crisis of leadership. So. That doesn't mean that we can't have some very good leaders, and we do. They do pop up from time to time. I could name a few in the world right now. Uh, but the overall trend seems to be in a downward direction. Pass. I, I, yeah, I take a different approach to it. I think we're all born leaders. I think we may not experience leadership at the same levels. We may not become the president or prime minister or uh, head of a major organization. But I think that because we all model life in some way, we all model a set of values and beliefs in some way that someone observes and may begin to follow. The moment we have one follower, all right, we are leaders. The question is, are we willing to take responsibility for that leadership with the people who are 
following us? And that's, that's, that's the bigger question in our society. You know, and we think about followers, we think about social media. I know people with over 100,000 followers and no friends. So they're able to get people to look at them for whatever reason, but they really don't know how to build relationships that sustain, that challenge them, that call for transparency, that call for vulnerability. And that's why our society, I think, one of the reasons why our society is so traumatized. We don't know. We are failing at relationships and our stewardship responsibility with relationships, whether it's in a leadership capacity or it's in a friend-to-friend -friend capacity or it's in some responsibility in serving society in some way. How are you able to, not only as a general, but in just all capacities of your life, to always not demand, but com you command the respect, you command the trust, the ability for people to believe in you, no matter what the institution or the circumstances may have been? So I don't talk about uh, myself and how people look at me. I will say that uh, since uh, the, the, the education that I received, the way my parents brought me up was to look at every human being and see the human potential there. So even if I'm, uh, you know, uh, if I have senior positions in the military or in the diplomatic corps, uh, I was educated uh, not to look at people from high up, but as human beings and see the potential in each and every one of them. And I believe that people uh, appreciate that. So, so you believe that every human being, dependent on the right leader, they have the capacity to be reached and can make a sudden change? Well, if you start out early enough, you know, in Proverbs 22, 6, it says, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he's old, and not depart from it. What that tells you is that patterns of behavior are established early on. And uh, that's, that's what uh, some of the Marxists, like Vladimir Lenin, understood. Vladimir Lenin said, give me your children to teach for four years, and the seed that I sow will never be uprooted, recognizing that that pattern is established. And it's very difficult to break those patterns later on. And that's, that's why there should be so much emphasis on character development early in the training. But what you also indicated in there uh, is that what may be planted may not be good. But still, it's the same pattern that he speaks of. Exactly. And, uh, and that's why we need to be very concerned as a society about what our children are being taught, what they're being exposed to. And I know there's a tendency to say, well, you know, let's have great diversity in terms of what we teach people and make sure they're exposed to everything under the sun, even little tiny children. You know, let's expose them to things that they might see later on in life. And, you know, there's a reason that, that children have parents. It's to be able to protect them and guide them and shepherd them in the right way. And, you know, there was a time when there used to be a lot of parent-teacher conferences, and those were very important because they were both working for the same thing to develop a successful child. We need to get back to those kinds of things once again. I think if we talk about leadership... Hold that point about talk about leadership. We're at a crossroads, but I think we're making progress in which direction we're headed. <laughs> I'm Armstrong Williams. Don't go away. We'll be back. <laughs> America at a crossroads. In case you're curious about us being here and at the Museum of the Bible and the design that we've created here. It is Gilberti's um, Gates of um, um, Paradise over here. Uh, and then this is Gus Rodin's um, Gates of Hell. And that's what it is the world is about, is where do our souls rest when we're done on this earth, when we take our last breath on earth and our first breath in heaven, a purgatory. That's the real battle of life. These other battles are meaningless. The real battle is the battle for the soul 
Where will we go when it's all said and done in this short lifespan that we have? Pastor, we were talking about leadership, and you were about to say something profound before yeah, we had to go to break. Yeah, profound. I don't know about <laughs> that, but I, I, let me say that leadership is about influencing people, hopefully for the good and not, not evil. Uh, there is positional influence and there's personal influence. You take, like, the ambassador who's a general. That is a position. So he carries positional influence, and individuals have to listen to him because of his position. But I think that, and, and I just, you know, picked that up from him, brief conversation in, in, in the green room before the show, I think that he understands the power of personal influence. Beyond his position, when he builds a relationship with those troops that he wants to be loyal to him, that's part of the task of true leadership. Ambassador is... Am I far I, off or I, I absolutely agree. I think that if you only base yourself on position and leadership, it will not suffice at the moment of truth. Mm -hmm. If you lead people and you want them to follow you and risk their lives, they will not do so only because of your position. Mm -hmm. They have to believe in, what you, in where you are leading them. And that's why you need also um, other types of leadership. So you can say the same about fathers and about principals and teachers, about anybody in a leadership position, the positional versus the personal. Absolutely. And all of those things, the family, as, as we talked about earlier on, plays a critical role in terms of a person's identity. And a lot of times when you have broken families, you have single-parent families and the one parent is out working all the time trying to support, you don't develop that relationship. Well, that child is still in need of a family. And that's why they so often become victims of gangs and other things which provide them with what they need. Unfortunately, it provides them with some of the things they don't need as well. But it, 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 it gives people some perspective on how vitally important that family relationship is. If that can be coupled with a nurturing and, uh, and productive relationship with the educational institute, you have a strong chance of developing a very successful young person. Yeah, if I, if I may chime, chime in, you know, uh, the ambassador spoke about individuals following him because they believe in him. Uh, and I think that's critical because true leadership inspires loyalty. And loyalty is not something you can buy. It's not something you can even earn or demand because then it's transactional. It's a gift that people give you when, number one, you identify their value. Number two, you increase that value as a result of their relationship with you or being under your leadership. And number three, you live out a set of moral principles you exemplify those principles before them. And I will tell you, they will give you the gift of loyalty. They'll follow you out and give their life for you on the battlefield. That's why we believe in God. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Ambassador. So I, I want to uh, talk about a uh, different dimension of everything we've been talking here about. You know, we talk about faith and belief in God and gratitude and all that. I want to mention the fact that there are those who abuse the name of God to do bad things. And we should not forget them. Look at our part of the world. We didn't discuss uh, politics, thank God. But I do want to mention that there are those, in our, especially in our part of the world, in the Middle East, who speak in the name of God, but uh, do exactly the opposite of what we think God wants. Look at the uh, Islamic Republic of Iran. They define themselves as a theology. Yet they are butchering their own people. Now for two months, hundreds of people killed in Iran. They lost all contact with their people. They just lost their people. And they are speaking in the name of God and butchering them. And we should match, uh, remember that when we talk about faith. To me, faith is like a radioactive power. Radioactive power is the most you know, is the strongest power to heal uh, maladies. At the same time, it could be used to buy, to build a nuclear bomb and destroy people. So it all depends where you take it. And we're talking about taking the nuclear power to do good. Pastor, you have an interesting look on your face. <clears throat> well, I'm, I'm listening, I'm, I'm, I'm processing, uh, I've been to Israel, I, I, I've, you know, been 
uh, amongst the Palestinians as well to try to understand the, the, the tension that's there uh, in, in that nation. But it's true that Israel is an example of resilience. Um, for well, 3,000 years of human history, they've always been under the threat of genocide and annihilation, which has caused an incredible resilience among them as a uh, people. So I'm just reflecting on, on that reality. I uh, believe in Israel's right to exist uh, as a state. I've been criticized and challenged for that. I could care less. I believe that deeply. I'm in support of the state of Israel and the Jewish people. Even when I may disagree in terms of how they may respond to some of the situations in their own nation. But yeah, there are people uh, and regimes and institutions and nations who, um, interesting, <laughs> in, in the fifth chapter, sixth chapter of Genesis, until God starts with a beautiful garden situation in six chapters, we mess it up, we human beings. So by chapter six, it says, and the earth was filled with violence. Mm -hmm. And that word violence in Hebrew is Hamas. Interesting. <laughs> Interesting. It's that true. is a word to express That's true. what they're experiencing from a specific regime, not a people that are subject to that regime. So that's what I was reflecting on. Perhaps, uh, uh, Dr. Carson, how hard is it being good, morally upstanding, doing the right thing? I mean, people look at the three of you, three moral men, three, I mean, righteous men, but that's not easy, is it? Well, uh, I'm not sure that any of us can actually uh, claim to be righteous. I did. I claimed it. <laughs> I, you know, I did, but it's okay. <laughs> we, can, we, we, we derive our righteousness through our Savior. But uh, what we need to understand is there are consequences for what we do. This is, this is outside of the fact that God will forgive you and accept you. There are still consequences for what you do. And if you think that through logically, you come to recognize that perhaps if I do the right things and I conduct myself in the right way, I will have less trouble. And generally, that is true. What do you draw your strength? Well, I, as I told you in our previous uh, conversation, I uh, grew up in a religious family. I received the religious education, and I draw a lot of my faith on certain things that I was taught uh, as part of that uh, faithful uh, upbringing. Verses like, uh, even as I walk in a valley of darkness, I shall not uh, fear evil. These are things that guide me. Or uh, fear nobody, fear only God. Talking about your question to uh, Dr. Carson, that's the way I feel about it. Pastor. I believe in God. I believe in his revealed plan for humanity, and that is human thriving. I believe in his current redemptive work and ultimately the restoration of the conditions of Eden, which is the real revealed plan in Scripture, both in the Hebrew Scriptures and in our New Testament as we complement that, that truth, that reality. So I abandon myself to divine providence whenever fear tries to hit me because of the realities of evil in the world in which we live. But how do we say the generation of young people that is in such crisis, with the mass killings, suicide, the drugs, the fentanyl, just no reverence for life. We, we, we get them in touch with their better self. They know good. We have built into us the uh, ability to recognize moral excellence. It's interesting, an experiment with a, a child, a little child, right? If you have a shiny penny in one hand and a dirty penny in the other hand, and you present that before a child, the child is going to instinctively, instinctively pick the shiny penny. Why? Because there's something inside of us that, that identifies excellence. What is true with the penny is true with morality. So we try to get them to tap into that that's inside of them and begin to live it out and understand the value of it personally and the value for the common good of society. But, you know, we, but we also must recognize the role of courage. You know, a lot of people who think the right way 
have a tendency not to be courageous in putting forth their point of view. And they stand in the corner with their head down and hope no one calls them a nasty name. You cannot succeed that way. You have to be willing to stand up for what you believe in. I would add to the word, I would add the word moral courage. Moral courage. Not just courage, but moral courage. Yes. You know, I think what's important is I think the essence of what I guess the ambassador, Pastor Bernard, and Dr. Carson said to us is that freedom doesn't come from man, it comes from God. And it takes just as much to maintain it as it did to establish it. And freedom is not for the faint of heart. It's a fight every day. But if you fight, you win. I want to thank all of you so much for joining us for this very special edition of Your Voice, Your Future.